Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Benick. Well, you know, a subject of great interest and controversy in New Hampshire during the past few years has been the extension of the Massachusetts commuter rail system into Nashua and potentially into Manchester and then Concord. Now, multiple studies have been done on the proposal, and truthfully, it does have an avid group of supporters. Uh, particularly from members of the Chambers of Commerce in both Nashua and Manchester. But there are also many, many, many opponents of the whole project who question its high cost, how many New Hampshire residents will actually use it, the almost certain need for its operation to be forever subsidized by taxpayers, and the fact that our more heavily traveled roads and bridges in New Hampshire are in dire need of repairs and improvements. Now, last year, the Governor's Council refused to accept a rather large federal grant to finance yet another study on the feasibility of bringing commuter rail into New Hampshire. And the grant would have had to have been met by hundreds of thousands of dollars of dollars in state funds. This year, rail proponents managed to once again get it before the Governor's Council. And <laughs> a few weeks ago, the now Democratic-controlled council voted to accept the federal grant. Councilor Chris Sununu, Sinu I'm sorry, opposed acceptance of the grant in both 2012 and 2013. Now, a few months ago, we did a Tell It Like It Is show with a proponent of commuter rail. Uh, in New Hampshire, and uh, that show was done with the longtime railroad activist and the former chairman of the Bedford Town Council, Mike Isbicki. Truthfully, that show got shelved, uh, primarily because we were concentrating on doing, as you may remember, a great number of shows dealing with the 2012 elections. Uh, so the show was shelved while those continued on, and it finally aired on BCTV just a few weeks ago. If you missed it, you can see it on the BCTV website, or you can go to our show's website, www.tellitlikeitisnh.com, and you will see it listed there under issues, and its name was The Future of Commuter Rail. On today's show, we're going to discuss the reasons why commuter rail may not be a good answer to New Hampshire's transportation needs. And my guest, who is sitting here patiently beside me, is none other than Governor's Counselor Chris Anunu. Now, Chris grew up in Salem, and he now lives in the seacoast over in Newfields with his wife, Valerie, and their two kids. He holds we, added, we added number three about oh, four weeks ago. Oh, so. congratulations. I, I should update my bio. Oh, my gosh. I <laughs> so. didn't know that. Oh, the We're little growing. one in the house. So not much sleep going on over there. Mm, almost not at all. <laughs> but trust me, I got commuter rail burned into my There brain. you go. There you go. Well, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Environmental Engineering from MIT. And he then spent 10 years working as an environmental engineer in regions across the United States, from New Hampshire to California, designing systems and solutions for cleaning up some of the country's most hazardous waste sites. He then came back to New Hampshire and became an owner and director of Sununu Enterprises, which is a family business and strategic consulting group, um, and they're based over in Exeter. Now, much of his time since then has been spent on local, national, and international real estate development, venture technologies, and business acquisitions. And recently, you probably saw in the paper that he led a group of local investors um, in the buyout of the Waterville Valley Ski Resort. So on top of everything else, he's now the resort's chief executive officer. Chris is a lifelong Republican, and in 2010, he ran for and was elected to the District 3 seat in the New Hampshire Executive Council, which I always call Governor's Council, as a lot of people in the state do, and he continues to hold that seat. It's a big district, um, and again, they all even out population-wise, but they don't necessarily even out in the number of cities and towns they cover. And Chris's district actually covers Portsmouth as well as 32 additional towns, um, some of them that I guess we could call cities like Salem, um, London Derry's approaching that, Derry's approaching it, Plastow, uh, Exeter. Uh, literally a very, very big region from the Massachusetts border that kind of comes up and then swings along Route 101 and covers that whole seacoast area. So it's a big district. 
Chris is also an avid skier, which is a good thing since he I now... I should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> since he's now running Waterville Valley yeah. and, and a rugby player as well. And something that I thought was kind of interesting was that in 1998, he completed a five-month hike of the Appalachian Trail from Maine to Georgia. You did your homework. had to be a hoot. It was, no, that, that, a hoot is a good word for it, yeah. but very, very good on your notes. You really did your homework there. Oh, we want people you to know, know more about a little me bit than about it. I, I, I forgot about uh, a lot of that You forgot a lot of it, huh? <laughs> I'm only, yeah, but I didn't know about I'm only the 38 new baby. years old, but I feel like I've lived five lives. But I didn't know about the new so, baby. And the new baby, yeah, yeah. yeah boy or girl? A boy, Leo. Uh, Leo, four weeks old. So, uh, so yeah, so no, it's, it's been great. It's now, been how many great. grandchildren does Grandpa ha and Grandma have now? You know, you're, while well, you're doing... The uh, you're going to have to count in your um, head now, aren't you? I think, I think Leo is number 16 Oh, or my gosh, something really? Like that. Yeah, that I should many. know, and I, I apologize Oh, your my, family, your family and gatherings family. have to be something. Um, when they everybody's always were under in the, the past. same roof. They, they were crazy in the past, and they're absolute insanity now. Yeah, well, so, how many? It's great. What, you have seven or eight kids? Uh, I'm number seven of eight. Uh, of eight. So I have seven <laughs> brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah busy house. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and neither of your parents ever showed the signs of that either. You know, they both seemed very, very calm. Uh, amazingly you know? even killed in the yeah. public eye, considering uh, yeah. having to, to, to put up and manage a, a pretty chaotic household. <laughs> but it was good. It was fun. It was a, a great How experience. How could it not be chaotic with that many kids? It's I mean, seriously. It's New Hampshire. What household isn't a little chaotic? <laughs> that's, that's the fun of being in New Hampshire. Yeah, really, huh? <laughs> well, you know, I know that you have a whole lot of knowledge on the subject. So, you know, a lot of speakers that I have in here, I have a whole list of questions. Um, but my questions to you are going to be very, very general because I know that you know this issue inside and out. So I guess probably the best place to start would be by you giving the viewers kind of a maybe a look, a little general a outline brief is, is history where we of yeah, the sure. uh, whole project in New Hampshire. Commuter rail, commuter rail in New Hampshire, it's, um, it's been going, the, the issue has kind of been tussled back and forth for, for 20, 30 years now. That um, long? It, it really has. I mean, wow. it's been talked about in, in various stages. Um, the, one of the bigger commuter rail projects we have actually runs through the heart of my district, right up through Exeter. Um, that's the Down Easter train, yes, which runs from Portland, Portland yeah. all the way to Boston. Yeah. Um, that's actually, as far as new um, commuter rail spurs go, that's probably one of the most successful in the country. It's really an amazing, really? an amazing story for actual commuters. For actual commuters, for actual uh, ridership. Um, but even with that said. Uh, the state of Maine still has to pay about eight million dollars a year to subsidize wow. it. So their ridership is great. The revenues are exactly where they thought it would be, but it still barely covers half the cost of running it. So I bring that up because unfortunately, um, throughout the history of commuter rail, it just doesn't pay for itself. Not even close. Mm. Um, nowhere in so the country, correct? No, pretty much nowhere in the country. Mm. Some, uh, some of the lines between Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, a couple mm -hmm. of those spurs uh, do okay. Mm -hmm. But um, by okay, we're looking at um, a 20 to 30 percent subsidy, not a 50 or in some cases 95 percent mm -hmm, subsidy. Mm -hmm. It just isn't cost effective. Um, there is value to it. I'm not a believer that um, every uh, <coughs> that um, it, it's okay if it doesn't have an absolute positive return on your investment because there is a global value you can uh, retain from it. Whether um, the project we're talking about is is the Nashua to Manchester to Concord spur coming out of Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, which potentially could drive some some um, ridership into Manchester Airport, could have some economic benefits to some of the the downtown hubs such as Nashua or Manchester. But you got to really look at, at what those benefits are and really understand them. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking at the preliminary costs of, of what we believe to not just build the infrastructure but to maintain it, or the, this commuter rail project over time, uh, to essentially so every time someone buys a ticket, the government has to fit the bill mm -hmm. um, at least 50 percent. Even if we were matched the most successful, like mm -hmm. I said, the most successful mm -hmm. rail project in the country, the government has to pay half the ticket every time someone rides it. Um, and when you look at those ridership numbers where they, where they, they, they'll probably fall out, um, it's very difficult to make a case that this is where we should be putting our dollars. This is where we should be looking to be financially responsible. That's mm -hmm. one of the roles, a lot of folks don't understand, that's one of the roles of the Executive Council to really help oversee the Executive Branch, make sure our dollars and are being spent in a reasonable, transparent, fair manner. Things are being bid out properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the biggest... And you've got to have a statewide perspective, not just the Absolutely. area that you're representing. Absolutely. Back in the 80s, the Executive Council was charged was charged with managing what we call the 10-year highway plan. Mm -hmm. So every yep. two years, we do public meetings across yep. the state. We get this, yep. everyone's input, and we decide where we think the projects are going to fall out over the next 10 years, mm -hmm. and we make some revenue estimates. Uh, most, almost all that money is derived from the federal government, mm -hmm. so we're uh, pretty much beholden to them. 
um, as to where that, that money will come from. But you make some estimates and the most important thing we can do as a council is be very responsible about where that money is coming from and where it's going to. Because if you're not at the state level, if you're not planning appropriately, mm -hmm. you're essentially making false promises to the lo at the local level, the regional planners, the towns. Mm -hmm. And when they Good hear point. that the state is going to commit to X, Y, and Z road, mm -hmm. they then build their planning off of that at mm -hmm. the local level. Mm -hmm. But when the state makes false promises, all of a sudden it really causes chaos at that local level mm -hmm. because they say, well, you were going to build this, uh, you were yeah. going to upgrade Main Street in 2015, yeah. now you're not going to do it, all our plans fall apart. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility on us into just doing it right. Mm -hmm. Looking at the dollars coming in, decide what the priority are, priorities are and going forward. At this time, with, with revenue shortfalls in the state, both at the state and federal level, um, it's just not the time to be looking at, 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 a, at a project like this. We are number 10 in this country. We have the 10 worst scenario of red listed bridges, and those are bridges that need the most number dire 10. help. And that's, that's a real safety issue. Oh, yeah. Um, we saw what happened out yeah. west when uh, a few years ago when, when their red listed bridges weren't taken care of. There was uh, some tragedies out there, yeah. and, and, and some people got killed. Yeah. I mean, and, and that really falls upon the government. The, the most fundamental role of government is essentially health and safety of the citizens, mm -hmm. health, safety, and security. Mm -hmm. That's where all our priorities need to go. Um, w we have other programming out there um, that, that addresses other issues, but in, in my philosophy is that has to be everything for us. Commuter rail is not a health and safety issue. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice idea. Um, mm -hmm. If times were really good and we were overflowing with money, maybe something to yeah, consider. But we're, not. <laughs> but we're looking at a $300 million capital bill, essentially, to build the spur from Lowell up to Concord. $300 million. That's a lot of money. I, nobody has even, we haven't even figured <coughs> out where, how we're going to finish I-93 yet. I know. The, the commercial know. corridor into the state, we're looking for about that same amount, 250 to $300 million. Mm -hmm. We don't even know where that money's coming from, mm -hmm. but we're already going to start looking at mm -hmm. spending it on a commuter rail project. Mm -hmm. that, look, at the end of the day, maybe takes five, 700 people mm -hmm. a day, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, it, it's just, it's not a good place to, to be allocating our dollars right now. It's not responsible. Well, you know, a lot of studies have already been done on this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why do proponents think that yet another study is needed? I'm not, I'm not getting the, well, this. Well, there, there, there's a couple, there's a couple issues. Um, the, some of the money, uh, a, a good chunk of the money will come from the federal government, yeah, one I way or that. the other, whether yeah. it's in the study or, or in the actual capital al allocation. But the state has to put up what? The state has to ma is matching the, the first phase, just to bring a little bit of background. Um, the council rejected to, uh, last year, but has come back and um, the Democrats pushed through um, what the, this study that will cost about $4 million. It's a, a, a lot of studying. It's a lot of studying and it's a lot of tax dollars. These are real <laughs> yeah, tax dollars. Really. These are your dollars, these are my dollars, these are the, the constituents' dollars. Um, the study is, is required by the federal government to see what is possible in terms of um, ridership and economic feasibility and all these other points. Uh, $4 million for a study, you can imagine. I used to be an engineer. I've seen mm. these things. They're mm. voluminous. Yeah. Um, and at the end of the day, the study will help us help us determine whether this is a good idea or mm -hmm. not. Um, it's extremely rare these studies ever come back and say that it's not a good oh, idea. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we can go in, there's a variety of reasons for that. So um, the state has to, has to put up some money, and, we're, and this state has chosen to do it in the form of what we call toll credits, about a million dollars worth of toll I credits. I heard that. Yeah. For, for specifically Route 3, right? Spe um, well, I don't know if they're specifically allocated to Route 3. Um, but they are out of the, the essentially the turnpike system. So um, y we get these credits uh, for the, the essentially the revenue that we will collect. Mm -hmm. We can essentially borrow off of that, if you will. Um, but but isn't that taking money away from all the other projects absolutely. in the state? Look, the, with, with any discussion, whether you want to talk about the federal government or the state government, um, there's only so many dollars that yeah. go in the pot. Yeah. And whether you want to talk about toll credits or actual dollars or revenue or whatever it might be, um, when you're putting money to one project, you're not putting it to another. And wasn't um, the whole purpose of road tolls to begin with? Exactly. To pay for the roads, mm -hmm. not just to build them, but to continue on with the maintenance in, and, and in, upgrading of them as needed. In theory, and, and, and mostly in practice, uh, money that's, that stays, uh, that goes into the turnpike system must stay in the turnpike mm -hmm. system. Because this project will actually, ben quote, benefit the turnpike system, because in theory it could take people off of those roads mm -hmm. and, and have an impact on it, uh, they do qualify. So technically, you can use the toll credits in a that, roundabout way. In a, in a roundabout way, that <laughs> so, has been deemed legal. So meanwhile, the the same number of people that stay on Route Three, it's okay if they're hitting potholes and. 
All uh, those kind of good things, huh? You know, it's it's frustrating. It's really <laughs> frustrating. Like I said, you know, we have a huge list we see every two years of all these roads that need work, um, whether they're to they're on the toll roads or the or the yeah. highway system yeah. or just the state road system. Yeah. And we just don't have the dollars yet. The Department of Transportation in the state has done a tremendous job doing so much with so little. Mm -hmm. um, the cost to build a road now, has, uh, compared to 10 years ago, has skyrocketed. Oh, yeah. The money we put into the system has plummeted. Yeah. Yet we still find a way to keep up and maintain barely mm -hmm. as many roads as we need to mm -hmm. just to, to meet some sense of adequacy. The big issue with me on uh, with transportation, uh, it really goes back to the red listed bridges. We've uh, we had to close the Memorial Bridge I over know. in Portsmouth. That's incredible. Um, a year early, uh, and we are rebuilding it, and that's terrific. It's it's a vital bridge, and it really connects um, Maine to the to the rest of the country, literally. Um, we have a, an issue with the Sarah Long Bridge, very similar issue. It's the number one red listed bridge in the state. It uh, just two weeks ago, the whole thing jammed up. Um, and I really saw that in the news. and really risk yeah. cutting the entire state of Maine. Uh, other yeah. than those bridges, you have Route 95. Route 95 ices up, you have an accident when the Sarah Long Bridge isn't running, and literally cars are not leaving the state of Maine, yeah, yeah. Uh, other than some of the bridges way up yeah. north. So it, it, it's really vital that we take care of our real infrastructure needs first. Take care of those projects we started, mm -hmm. instead of going off into fantasy land talking about projects that have no, ever, no, no chance ever of being financially feasible mm -hmm. or really providing uh, the net benefit you could with 300 plus million dollars into the till. Imagine what you could do with 300 million dollars. Mm -hmm. You could finish I-93. Mm -hmm. That takes year care of 10 years worth of red listed bridges in the state. 10 that many, years that worth. One. Yes, we put about 25 wow. million dollars a year uh, to 30 million a year into our red listed bridges. 300 million would cover literally 10 years of red listed bridge repair. Wow. Yet we're going to look at a single rail system that goes from Lowell to Nashua to Manchester Concord. Um, it just doesn't make sense right now. It does oh, not make sense for this. One state. of the things, too, is it's only, I mean, for the, the people who say it does make sense, only for a, a, a portion of the population, a small section of the state. Absolutely. It's not going to benefit the whole rest of the if, state. If you live, you know, five to ten miles outside of Nashua or Manchester or Concord, yeah. where these stations will be, um, you're going to get on the highway system and use yeah. the We have actually a very yeah. robust, and, and once I-93 gets finished, we'll, we'll have a, a great corridor in here. Getting into Boston isn't the challenge it used to be in the 70s well, or 80s. Well, not only that, but most people are going to use the highway system to get to the train station. Well, <laughs> So this brings up the next point. When when you take a train somewhere, you get off the train. Yeah. You gotta you gotta get to work somehow. Yeah. You gotta make that next step. Yeah. In downtown Boston, it makes great sense. You have cabs, buses, an inner city subway system. You have all this infrastructure yeah, that, that's in that place. That gets expensive. Plus, it adds to your commuting time. Absolutely. You know, a lot of right now, the state of uh, all states gets something we call C CMAC funding. Mm -hmm. It's um, con congestion mitigation and air quality control funding. It's funding that really goes towards um, trying to try to provide a, an environmental service, if you will, mm -hmm. whether it's clean air or, or some other alternative modes of transportation. And mm -hmm. it's great. In this state, we use it for our bus system. Um, we use it for the, both like the, the Boston Express or some mm -hmm. of the local bus systems out on the seacoast. Mm -hmm. We have what we call coast. It, it, it goes to the nursing homes and the, the, um, the elderly communities, mm -hmm. the hospitals, the grocery stores, those real practical stopping mm -hmm. points for folks so they can still stay connected with the community. In the state of Maine, they use 100% of their CMAC funds to support the Downeaster train. Is that right? They don't have that funding that we do wow. for all of their, their other bus services. So when somebody says to me, well, people are going to commute into Nashua to go to work, that's a, a ludicrous concept. Mm -hmm. um, I live right just outside of Exeter. I'll tell you, nobody gets off that train in the morning mm -hmm. to go to work mm -hmm. um, because you're stuck at the train station. Mm -hmm. There's no way to get mm -hmm. to your office. We don't mm -hmm. have yeah. th those type of office yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, um, centralized points. Yeah. Um, so, and then to say that we're going to expand our bus system to bring people from the trains to their offices, that's another crazy concept because a bus, is, even if you had it, the bus isn't going to stop at everyone's workplace. Of course and not. by the way, we're now eating into all of the funding that supports that bus yeah. system. So if anything, yeah. we're going to be decreasing a system that is robust, that serves um, our most needy constituents, mm -hmm. and replace it with some overbloated giant rail system mm -hmm. that frankly... Uh, the Manchester Airport and, and the Manchester Chamber of Commerce would love to see The National Chamber mm -hmm. of Commerce, sure enough, would love to see it. But does it really fulfill a greater need for the state of New Hampshire? Yeah. It, it doesn't. And, and, you know, when you think about it, I mean, a lot of commuters are heading out to towns all along 495, which obviously the train won't serve them. A lot of commuters are heading down into the Merrimack Valley area of Andover mm -hmm. and so on, um, you know, places that are almost contiguous to 93. 
that the train isn't going to get them mm -hmm. there. Then you have a whole ton more people who are working on 128. Look, if you want to bring people from New Hampshire and give them a good ride into downtown Boston to mm -hmm. their jobs, you know, mm -hmm. driving jobs to mm -hmm. Massachusetts, great idea. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's going to serve five to 700 people. Mm -hmm. It's supporting not jobs in New Hampshire, but mm -hmm. jobs out of state. True. Nobody's, again, nobody's taking this train to come to work in New Hampshire. Yeah. yeah. Um, there isn't the, you know, if you want to talk about the benefit to the airport, I think there probably is a pretty good case to be made that folks from uh, northern Massachusetts will now have better access to the Manchester airport. I think that's a tremendously good thing, but at the cost of $300 million, uh, yeah. um, imagine the taxi service yeah. you could provide. Yeah, <laughs> you could then, provide for that door-to-door uh, I mean, like, -door yeah. instead of a, a, yeah. a commuter service. And so what there's about just the better practical ways to do aspects? It. I mean, yeah, they could maybe take a train to the airport. But if it has nothing to do with the schedule of the flight they're going out on, or when they get off the plane, if they're getting off yeah. the plane at 11 o'clock at night, well, what are they going to do, sleep at, over at the at train station? At most, you're probably looking at only, only four to six trains per day going north. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the arguments uh, back when they created the Down Easter years ago over in my district, it, it does stop in Durham at mm -hmm. the UNH, at the, at the university. Mm -hmm. uh, the argument was, hey, po folks can take the train in to see the ball game now. Okay, great. You know, so once a year you can take a train in to see the ball game, but actually the last train out of the city leaves about eight o'clock. Yeah. So you can, even if you leave yeah. the Red Sox game at night, get on the highway, put your thumb out. I guess that's right. There's no train to bring you home. So you got to be practical about how you're going <coughs> to argue this stuff. Excuse there me. are some benefits to be sure, but not at the insanely high cost well, that it is, and we yeah. just don't have the yeah. money. It, it's just not there. Yeah, right. that, that's the part that scares There's me. Just and no again, money. traditionally, since no um, rapid transit or commuter rail system is operated in the black without needing taxpayer dollars, massive taxpayer well, I don't dollars. understand why they think in New Hampshire that yeah. that's going to change. You know, people they love the concept, they love well, the idea, and look, I, the I, romance I, of trains. Yeah, and all I, that. I ride the train in Exeter. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. And I should probably send a thank you note to the people of Maine every time I get on that train. <laughs> because they're paying for it. But now we're going to have to pay for yeah. it uh, with, this, with this system. Um, you know, I've talked to folks in Concord. I don't even think they want it. If you've noticed, the, the folks in Concord have stayed pretty quiet yeah, on the see, issue. Yeah, it's pretty blasé about it up because there. Because it, yeah. it, it goes, the, 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 train, the, the train terminus uh, that they're looking at in Concord is right in, in the middle of a prime economic development area that actually doesn't really need train service. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you notice that they're staying kind of quiet on it, I know the airport would love it for the reasons we've discussed. You know, if you wanted to look at a spur from Lowell to downtown Nashua, just that piece, mm -hmm. okay, that's probably 60 to $70 million to build it. it would just still for that piece. Just for that piece. It would still require a subsidy, but clearly not as much because you're not mm -hmm. maintaining, you know, 20 mm -hmm. to 30 extra miles of track. If you wanted to look at just that piece, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually game for that. And, and by that, I mean, let's look at a study that's efficient. You don't need a $4 million mm -hmm. study to look at that. You can do it for a few hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Like, as you brought up in the beginning of the, the show, there are other studies that have already been done on this. Well, you yeah. can update those studies, not do a whole new one. Yeah, that's, that's what I don't get, why, why it would cost so much money to the do federal yet government, study. The Obama administration and the federal government, to be very blunt, is train crazy right now. They are train <laughs> happy. They're talking about the billion-dollar bullet, bullet trains out in California, and, it's, and it's, it's leaching all the way over here. They just want to promote this thing. It's union heavy. It's massively subsidized. It's an agenda they've pr been promoting for years, and they're not going to stop now. So they don't want to go just uh, uh, piecemeal it in. Mm -hmm. I mean, why don't we baby step this in? See if it works mm -hmm. in, a, in a congestion area like Nashua. Mm -hmm. See if it does have the successes before we commit to going all the mm -hmm. way to Concord. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a failure at Nashua, it sure is going to be a failure at Concord. Let's not go spe spend all those hundreds of millions of mm -hmm. dollars more to see how it works. And that way you get to... You get to understand the pushes of pull. Government does very little very well, as, well, as a lot of us know. We yeah. just don't, we, it just doesn't work like that. That's why I think the executive council is so critical, because we try to provide that efficiency into mm -hmm. the system as best we can. Mm -hmm. um, some outside perspective, some independent private sector experience to make sure that we're not just, again, throwing our, our dollars, uh, bad dollars, or good dollars after bad, so to say. So again, if you want to baby step things in, I'm a big believer that in any aspect of government, understand it, understand the pros and cons, the pushes and pulls, but to just ram this forward because um, the union, you know, the, the Amtrak loves it, the unions love mm -hmm. it, the, the, the rail nuts out there love it, and mm -hmm. yes, I said it, they're rail nuts. There are people <laughs> that just love trains, no, you know, no matter what. Oh, I and know. And unfortunately, that's exactly I what know. you're having here. People that just love the concept yeah. without looking at the practical. But how much are they actually going to yeah. go buy a ticket and ride and, it? And that was the most frustrating thing, to see my fellow executive counselors up there making arguments that uh, made no sense, to mm -hmm. be very blunt about it, mm -hmm. that um, had no practical Im implication. At most, even, even the most ardent proponents of this 
admit that maybe you're getting one half to one percent of the people off the roads. You know, if you're going to take them off the highway and put them in a train. Only one half to one yeah, percent. That's, I mean, you have, you, you have uh, something between 50 and 100,000 cars a day going down 93 yeah. and, and, yeah. and, and, um, and the, uh, Route 3. Yeah. Uh, this train at most is looking at five to 700 people. Okay, so uh, that's it. That's it. So to, to make an argument that you're that going just to... just doesn't seem to justify the spending. Of course not. And, and I heard arguments that we're going to be able to spend less on our highways because of this... Tra that, that's ludicrous. Well, yeah. You, you don't yeah, pave... You don't do 98% of the paving yeah. because 1% is taken yeah. off the road. Yeah. It just doesn't work like that. You yeah. don't do less lanes on the road because 1% of the people have been taken off of it. Um, it's just... I didn't realize the numbers were that low. It, it's, it's that low. Wow. And, and look, come to Exeter, Dover, or, or, or uh, Durham in, in mm -hmm. over on the seacoast. You'll see what the ridership numbers are. They're, it's decent. There's a lot of people in the morning that take it into Boston. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Let's, are mm -hmm. we trying to ship jobs to Boston? I think that's a terrible idea. But mm -hmm. a lot of people do use it there. Uh, they come back at night, and that's it. But businesses aren't thriving into any of those mm -hmm. areas. Um, the usability at night for the social aspects mm. of bringing our, our, our constituents down into, into Boston and, and mm -hmm. making us mm -hmm. a little more a bedroom Boston community, it, it's very tough to justify because the, the trains don't run that late. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all these things that people hope will come just don't happen. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we have to write the check. The state will have to write, not $8 million, by the way. This system will be a lot bigger than the Down Easter. You're looking at 10, 11, 12, 13 million per year. Imagine what this state could do. That will only do. continue to go higher Absolutely. as costs go up. Absolutely. Every time you get on that train, the state will, will have to write a check. And it's just, it's not fair to the people. It's mm -hmm. taking money away from, from viable product projects. And I think it's just, we have to be responsible. As much as you, you love, I love riding that train over mm -hmm. in, in Exeter. Oh, I do. Yeah, it's fine. But it, yeah. it's fine and, and yeah. it has its purpose. I ride it maybe two or three times a year mm -hmm. for, for various things. My kids like to... And I get on it. We'll go up to Portland or we'll go yeah. to ice cream. And yeah. by the way, you take the, the train to Portland. Yeah. Does it let you off in downtown Portland? Well, no. Where's of course. Where does it let you off? Way out, way out in the outskirts. Really? Yeah. Because I've, I've never the, seen the train station the depot in was out there. Really? Yeah. So again, so is, what do you have to take a cab or a bus into the city if you wanted to go? Yeah, to the city? exactly. You, do, you can take a bus or a cab, and it's fine if you're on a <laughs> if you're not on a tight schedule. But it's <laughs> it's not fine if you know for truly day to day practical well, yeah, purposes. Yeah, that's not fine if you're this train is not with a bunch of kids either. That's right. Yeah. I think it's pretty expensive when you have to keep adding on different modes of transportation Absolutely. to the whole little day out. Absolutely. And look, the price of, 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 of oil and gas goes up, and that's a tough burden on folks when they want to get in their car. I understand that. But if you look at where gas has gone and, the, and, and, and how cars are being used, they are becoming more fuel efficient. Our, our, our highways are getting better. Mm -hmm. I-93 will be completed soon. So mm -hmm. the idea of driving into Boston is actually as good of an offer as, as it ever has been, mm -hmm. um, even with the high price of gasoline. So again, you will get people to use this train. There's no question. Yeah. But are we going to $300 million to take care of 500 people a day? Yeah. Ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. Ludicrous. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. tend to agree. And yeah, you're right. There will be people because they don't like driving or it drives them crazy to sit in traffic sure. or they'd prefer to take a nap on the way to work yeah. or read a book or yeah. whatever. So yeah, the, you know, there'll be some of those. I had somebody make the argument to me that uh, the trains will allow people to do more work on the trains to and from work, <laughs> um, which I suppose that's true. But mm -hmm. if that's your argument for building a $300 million system, that by building it, we can force our, our, our employees to, to work more and longer <laughs> hours. Um, in the United States, we, we, um, we work insane hours. Uh, and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and don't get me wrong, if you want to take the train and relax and, and you want to um, pull out your laptop, that's fine. But I don't think it should be a justification to yeah, ask really. so the employers of Boston can force the employees of New Hampshire to do mm -hmm. more work at longer. It's, it, again, if that's the best argument you got going, mm -hmm. there's no argument here for mm -hmm. this. There's just not. Well, a lot of the proponents talk about the time savings, and I mean, realistically, I don't know that there would be that much of a time savings. I don't savings. see it. I, I don't I, see it either. I live over on the seacoast. I'm in and out of, out of Boston in, uh, in one hour each way. I can get yeah. to the airport. Yeah. Um, the, this train would not, again, it has to stop along the way. That's and pick, right. Pick, pick everyone that's else right. up. That's right. So uh, there's definitely no, no, no time savings there. And you know, something else I, I want to bring up is, is who's going to do this study? Okay, there's very few companies actually that can actually do this kind of work. And every one of them that do the study are really can also do the big piece of the work, whether so it's the design and engineering. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's an, an absolute conflict of Welcome interest with the, with the folks that are doing the study. They have every interest in making sure that the study comes out with yeah, a favorable yeah, result because yeah, yeah. they'll be in a position to 
have the most knowledge yeah. to bid on the second and third phases yeah. where the real money comes into yeah. play. So we, we've completely lost the sense of conflict. Uh, uh, we've, we've added so much conflict of interest in it mm -hmm. by not asking them to exclude themselves from further mm -hmm. um, aspects of the project. I would have felt even a little better about it if at least I knew that it would be a true third-party study mm -hmm. by a group that had no interest in seeing it, mm -hmm. seeing the results mm -hmm. go one way or the other. But, but they we obviously don't. have an interest. And, and the company that's doing the, the work, it's uh, URS out of Salem. Uh, they're a great company. I, as an engineer, I work with them uh, uh, many, for many, many years. They, um, um, they do great work. There's no question about it. But they have a clear yeah. interest in seeing oh, yeah. a study yeah, that comes out and yeah. says an absolute bias. So, yeah. again, I, I don't see where the... Where the uh, where we've really done our job in making mm -hmm. sure that we're spending our dollars uh, efficiently, we're providing the best service for our constituents, we're taking care of our real needs, mm -hmm. and we've removed the conflicts of interest that this just inherently has. It, it's it's a mess, and that's why I use the word all the time. It's a boondoggle. Mm -hmm. Is a mm -hmm. typical government boondoggle project where your tax dollars, your tax dollars, my tax dollars mm -hmm. are being completely wasted um, because of the um, um, the self interest of mm -hmm. a couple of spe uh, special groups out there that are really pushing the Democrats and a lot of proponents of this just to drive it forward because, mm -hmm. because we should. Mm -hmm. It's the worst excuse in the world. Well, yeah, but look at how many programs we have because we should Absolutely. that are killing us. Absolutely. Now, you, did, am I wrong that back a couple of months ago as the new legislature was going to be ready to take their seats in Concord, wasn't there a little bit of manip manipulation legislatively that helped this whole prospect of a new study being done and money being used from tolls and That so would be on. the toll credit piece. So toll credits have to be approved by the fiscal committee, uh, a joint committee of, of, the, House, legislature. of the legislature, both the House and the Senate. Um, and uh, so through, through approving that, mm -hmm. that allowed it to that then opened get, the door. that opened the door and allowed it to come back to the executive council. And I would have, I, I would have liked to see obviously a lot more now prudence. Now who pushed uh, that? They. <laughs> the proverbial they, they pushed it. All the proponents that are pushing it now um, really leaned on, on a lot of those folks. And again, this isn't just a couple hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Or ten, this yeah. is millions of yeah. dollars for a study. Yeah. Just the study. And, and they didn't have a problem with this, knowing all the, the little, what should we call them, fiscal cliffs in New Hampshire that Absolutely. we're hovering on. And we really are hovering on a I lot know, of fiscal yeah. cliffs, where there's health and human services, the mental health system, the university yeah. system. There's a lot of folks out there that really need dollars. Or yeah. the transportation system, the, our yeah. highway system yeah. is suffering yeah. horribly. And Commissioner Clement has done a great job at transportation um, of, of, again, doing so much with so mm -hmm. little. And mm -hmm. now we're asking him to do so much more with so much less. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it again, it sense. takes the toll credits yeah. away for other projects. It potentially puts our CMAC funding or other funding avenues that, again, the dollars have to come somewhere to subsidize this train. Mm -hmm. So it puts all those dollars, not a couple hundred thousand, but millions at mm -hmm. risk mm -hmm. that are no longer going to be there. So how do you pay for that? Mm -hmm. Taxes. Yeah. Taxes. That's the, that's the that's only answer. answer to everything. And nobody wants to talk, talk about the T word. But this gets supported with tax dollars, your dollars today and our dollars tomorrow. So it's, it's just abusive. And so, you know, people can talk all, all day long about no sales tax and no income tax. I, I'm the strongest proponent that those broad-based taxes are a disaster for the state. Mm -hmm. But if we keep mm -hmm. going down the path we're going with the budgets we're seeing out there, with projects like this out there, there is no way to avoid those horrible taxes that then reduce what we call the New Hampshire advantage, that take away a lot of the specialty aspects of what we have, that reduce that local control that we count so much on. Mm -hmm. Tax dollars, tax dollars, tax dollars, that's the only way to keep supporting the abuse of spending we see going on in Concord. And this is, I think, a pinnacle project for what I call the boondoggle of Concord spending. Well, I, I agree with you that it's a boon tunnel. I, I absolutely agree with you. Now, if it were, and, and again, I know you've studied this issue extensively. So say, for instance, surprise, surprise, the study says, yay, let's do it. And, and it will. <laughs> <laughs> and the state now commits to it. And, you know, away we go. How much is the cost of mm -hmm. this whole thing is going to fall on us. Is the uh, the feds going to pay for it, or are we in New Hampshire? I mean, obviously, yeah. federal money we're paying for too. Right, that's the most you important know, thing to start seems with. To forget that, federal part. money yeah. is still your money. Yeah, it's still exactly. your taxpayer dollars. Exactly. Um, 
Uh, my guess, and, and no one really knows, but my guess is that a good chunk of the funding would, well, it would have to come from the federal government. There's no, the state just, there's no way the state could pay for Couldn't it. Couldn't possibly could, afford it. You could bond it. You could, you could borrow the money. But to be honest, the state, we're not in, in, a, in a dangerous zone at all. But we, we're, we're kind of near our bonding capacity. We've mm -hmm. borrowed a lot. Yeah. And like I said, we still don't even know how we're going to finish I-93. That may require some more borrowing, which I'm not completely against. You can borrow money today for municipal projects and state projects at an insanely low interest rate. Mm -hmm. So it actually is a great time to borrow that money because when you look at the long-term rate of inflation, I, you don't want to call it free money, but the, you're, you're paying almost nothing for mm -hmm. it, for the, for the ability to do it. So um, I don't mind that aspect right now. You've you got to be careful not to creep it too high. But when you're looking at the, to your, to your question, the $300 million, who's going to pay for that? The bulk will probably be from the federal government, I imagine. Um, well, do you think that $300 million figure is even going to stay there, or do you think it's going to boost up way higher? It could go, it, it, of course it could go higher, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and so, program, so, right? so that brings us to, what's the timing of this? Yeah. Okay, we do this yeah. study, the study gets finished in about 18 months. Yeah. Um, do we go right after the, 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 to the federal government and say, give us $300 million? Um, it would be hard to do that, again, when we haven't even taken care mm -hmm. of our own house in terms mm -hmm. of our infrastructure here. So there's a chance this project doesn't even, even if, if it, we wanted to make it come to a fruition, mm -hmm. it doesn't for years and years down the road. And guess what happens then? You need another study. Mm. <laughs> These studies only have a certain shelf life, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. The environmental aspects of yeah. it, the demographics, yeah. the population densities, that all changes over time. Yeah, that's true. And so you need another study. Yeah. And guess who loves to do that? The folks doing the study. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they get paid again. <laughs> so, again, we're looking to do this at a time that it just makes so little sense to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I said, 10 years down the road, the economy's back, our infrastructure's complete, our debt load at the state level's way down. Um, somehow trains have found a way maybe mm -hmm. through technologies to be more efficient. We don't have to provide mm -hmm. these massive subsidies. Maybe we should look at it. Absolutely. But today, mm -hmm. in 2013, with all that we have upon us, um, just irresponsible. Well, you know, now, if this did, and, and obviously it, it, well, I mean, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that it's more of a democratic initiative than a Absolutely. Republican one. Absolutely. No, without a doubt. So, I mean, if they manage to get this whole project through, and obviously the state of New Hampshire will have to pay something for it, what are they proposing? Where are they saying the money to well, pay is going to come from? The answer from? there really I comes mean, are they out. talking about an income tax, a sales tax? Oh, they'll, never, oh, they'll never talk about that. That's well, they for won't sure. talk about they'll it never out say loud, that, yeah. but is that where they're going? My guess is the study will come back and, and say something like, okay, if you want to build it, it will cost X, and here's the, the rough sense based on the ridership, th these ridership numbers. Uh, it'll cost Y to, to subsidize. Then you'll get into. Then you'll have to have the discussion of, of where the money comes from. Nobody wants to talk about that now except me. Uh, yeah. But if you st again, the worst thing government can do is not plan for the future, and yeah. that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah. We're putting the cart before the cart before the cart before the horse, yeah. and um, uh, because it sounds good. Mm -hmm. But you gotta you gotta just think sensibly. It's not that I don't. I, like I said, I love trains, uh, mm -hmm. and even the most you know staunch rail opponents. I think we all like to take train rides. That's that's great. Well, now um, and then. And like I said, there are some quarters where it every day, though. Yeah, New York to Philadelphia to Washington. There are some quarters where the subsidy is very low, or, or mm -hmm. it can make some economic sense um, in those. Yeah, but, but again, I mean, we're you talking. You can't compare Nashua, for God's sakes, to New York City. Exactly. Well, they would love you to. Know. Oh, they would I mean, absolutely love to. But uh, of course not. It, it just we don't have the an, a working infrastructure that. Where that makes sense, where you have a, yeah. a centralized system where you can get out and within a couple blocks yeah. everybody walks to yeah. work. Yeah. Um, by the way, last time I checked, we lived in New Hampshire and it snows <laughs> and it's freezing. <laughs> Nobody's walking from this train over that's to their office building. Uh, that's for, the for truth, more than isn't half it? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's just it doesn't make sense. Well, you know, I and I've heard the the proponents say over and over again that if we go ahead with a commuter rail project, that it's going to create tons of new jobs for New Hampshire. <sighs> what do you say to that? No, <laughs> it won't. <laughs> it just won't. It doesn't work like that. Look, look at Exeter. Okay, I live. Yep. I live just outside of Exeter. Yeah. There, there's no new jobs created because the train is there. None. None. The the home home values haven't gone up because the train is there. Not one bit. They haven't at all. No, no. Of really? course. Not. Really. No, no. Because they always say that that's going to be one of the benefits. They say that's the no. It doesn't work like that. It just they say that because in theory it sounds like that should happen, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. Um, people don't move in to the seacoast because they can get in their car, drive 10, 15, 20 minutes to mm -hmm. get on a train that'll take them an hour and a half to get into Boston. Mm -hmm. That isn't, mm -hmm. th people move to the seacoast mm -hmm. or, or Nashua or Manchester or Concord 
for other reasons, mm -hmm. for schools, for uh, you know other economic development mm -hmm. drivers. Sure. Uh, it just businesses don't go there. In fact, the, one of the biggest businesses in Exeter just left because they were so frustrated with working with the town of Exeter. Sig really? Arms, Sig Arms moved over to Portsmouth. One of the best employers we have in the state. They're growing. They're vibrant. Um, but they couldn't get along with the town so much, they left. Wow. No, no businesses have come in to Exeter because of it. Nobody takes, uh, go to the train station at 8 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets off the train. Mm -hmm. Everyone gets on the train, mm -hmm. and it goes south, and it takes mm -hmm. them into Boston. And that's great. There's a lot of people in there that do need that, do need that um, alternative mm -hmm. maybe to get to work, or that choose to, to, <coughs> to use that alternative. Excuse me. How many? Mm -hmm. A couple hundred. Mm. It, that's nice. And, and, and again, we're fortunate because the state of Maine pays for us every time. Mm -hmm. So let's, look, mm -hmm. they set up a yeah, bad that's, deal. That's Go ask the folks yeah. in Maine if they <laughs> want all, all that $8 million back. Yeah, you sure. bet they do. I bet it's they a, do. They would, some of those folks up there would be the first to tell you that was a boondog of a project, and into perpetuity, they are stuck paying for that. Well, and you'll, you know, you'll hear that, oh, well, construction will create all these new jobs. Well, I mean, they're temporary jobs, number one. Sure. And a good many of the workers probably are from out of state anyway that work for the big Absolutely. construction and, and companies. Absolutely, and look, I, I'm, I'm all for, for good construction projects that create that, that, that's, a, that's a great thing, yeah. but we sh again, there's a cost to that. Yeah. There's a yeah. massive cost yeah. to that. Absolutely. There are other, again, if I handed the state $300 million, think of all the different ways mm -hmm. we could create jobs. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should focus on building schools. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should focus on um, expanding our mental health care system or the hospital system mm -hmm. or, or the, the, dis the dis disability services that we need in the city. Those are vital core mm -hmm. projects that can also create jobs, that can create good programs, mm -hmm. that can create... Um, those fundamental needs that our citizens need. Mm -hmm. We do not need a train. There is no need. The word need should never be discussed uh, in reference to commuter rail. It's a convenience, and a convenience that has simply no place in our state right now. Well, even you know, if it did get going, the number of jobs actually to run those trains is pretty small. Um, you know, I couldn't comment on that directly, but last time I checked, um, a couple guys drive the train and a couple guys walk in the train and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean the the train station the tickets or whatever there's yeah. nobody the, the train station is essentially automated it's an yeah. automated yeah. and online ticket yeah, exactly. service so it's not some we don't we're not building Penn Station here yeah you know exactly uh, so again it, it just doesn't work and you know that gets me to to so what is it really replacing you know it, in theory it's taking a few hundred people off, off the roads mm -hmm. but something that we haven't talked about is our bus system. The Boston Express service that we have that runs right through Manchester and mm -hmm. Nashville yep. is one of the most successful in the country with a subsidy that has gone from basically 50% 50, uh, 50 down to less than 10%. It's almost unsubsidized it now, is that low now because it's so successful. The fares at the box pay for almost the entire... Yeah, the fares aren't bad at all. They, they pay for, and mm -hmm. they pay for almost the entire system itself. Wow. Um, the state has supported it with some, some capital upgrades, but that's a great, vibrant system. Mm -hmm. Commuters love it. It's mm -hmm. convenient. It has more stops than the train would. It doesn't require rails oh, and especially, infrastructure. Especially stops at places like Logan Airport, which it, would be one of the big reasons right. for people to not use their car. That's right. And it uses the highways that are already yeah, in there place. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if we, we have already have a great commuter system in place. Mm -hmm. what, why, what, do we, what need are we really trying to fulfill here? Mm -hmm. We're not fulfilling a need. We're, f we're fulfilling a want of the trail nuts that, and advocates that are out there. And just look at their arguments. Look at the arguments that were made at that executive council meeting. It was a joke. I'll be very blunt. It was a joke. This past one? Yeah, absolutely, January. when they took the vote. Um, th there wasn't much of an argument because not much of an argument could be made. And the ones that were made really had no basis in fact or reality. Again, the idea that we were going to spend less on our highway system uh, maintaining it because more people were going to be on the train. I can't even begin to tell you how... Um, illogical. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's patently untrue. It's again by taking one percent of the people off the roads, yeah. we don't yeah. have to spend as much on the roads. Yeah. It make, makes no sense. No. It so if, again, if that's your best argument, then why are we even discussing this? But unfortunately, look, th th those that are in power want it. Uh, they they voted for it. They have every right to do so. We have to go down that process. Oh, so and it's I, three to I two vote. Uh, th uh, four to one. Four, four, uh, four to one. You were the only one who objected. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. La when you last know, year it was what? Last year it was three to two against. Three to two. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I speak a lot to the folks up in the North Country. Um, there are some rail lines in the North Country that are very successful because they're freight lines. Yeah. They're commercial yeah. freight lines. Yeah. It's a whole different economic yeah. model. Yeah. And they, they are out in the middle of nowhere. That's right. Yeah. And they're bringing um, services and goods yeah. up to the businesses around yeah. there that help those businesses survive and thrive, which really create the, help mm -hmm. maintain and create jobs in the North Country. Mm -hmm. What I tell folks all the time is every dollar you spend on a rail system in the South is a dollar 
dollar you're not spending on a rail system in the north. Mm. Nobody from um, um, Littleton mm -hmm. um, uh, or even Laconia is going to get in their car mm -hmm. and drive down to the train mm -hmm. station, park your car, hop, hop on a train to continue into Boston. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, no, that doesn't it work. Happen. No. So no. the people in the north country, uh, the most, are going to be paying for a system that they virtually will never use. Mm -hmm. That's not fair to them. It's not fair to them. And mm -hmm. let's, so let's focus our, tr our rail dollars on things that will benefit the constituents as a whole, it, whether it's commercial or, or freight lines, which, I, which I've supported. Mm -hmm. um, even, again, look at the, the Down Easter or, or even a project we talked about a little bit, a project they're looking at doing in Plastow. That's a, those are commuter rail projects that, frankly, other folks are paying for. And if the knuckleheads in Maine and, and Massachusetts want to pay to support the commuter rail in our state, mm -hmm. I'll absolutely look at that oh, all yeah. day long. Might as well check because it, those yeah. are state dollars yeah. that they want to yeah. allocate to it. You know, they, they made their bed, yeah. they can lie in yeah. it, and, and we can reap would the be, benefits. It would be kind of silly uh, not to check that birthday present. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, that's exactly right. It would be a great birthday present. So I'll look at those projects all day long mm -hmm. because the economics make sense. They can bring some, some support to those communities. But again, this line going up through Nashua to Manchester, to, all the way to Concord, makes no sense. Well, I'm going to guess that you would say that the argument that uh, proponents use that, you know, putting in that, that line will bring all kinds of new economic growth to the towns because businesses will just be flocking up to, to build right near those stations. Show me where it's happened. Yeah, well, show, that's, me, show me yeah, where it's happened. It hasn't I, I, happened, I has have, it? I have the most successful line in my district, and it has not happened. At all? No, <laughs> no not at all. Even I mean, beyond Dexter? No, 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 no. I mean, look, businesses are thriving. And that's been around how long? Be, uh, Ten years or so. Yeah, it's been yeah. a while. I mean, businesses on the seacoast are doing pretty well. Not has nothing to do with the train being there. It has nothing to do with the train being there, unless unless you're in the business of maintaining the train, I suppose. Unless you're, you know, in the business of running that train. Uh, you know, maybe Amtrak has a satellite office out there. That's all I know that, and they're loving it. But. No, there's so many other reasons that you come to New Hampshire. We have all these other incredible forces at work that yeah. have really yeah. maintained that New Hampshire advantage, the economic value, the life, um, the quality of living, and the lifestyle that we have here. All these other factors come into play, whether it's the fact that we have the mountains and the lakes and the oceans, mm -hmm. um, the fact that we have such an educated workforce And Waterville here. Valley skiing resort. And Waterville Valley, waterville.com. <laughs> Don't forget to get your season passes down. No, um, but, no but, but seriously, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll throw my hat in on that a little bit. One of the reasons that, I, you know, we invested in, and, we, and I dedicate my time to a place like Waterville Valley is because it's locally owned. Mm -hmm. It's locally controlled. It's part of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Skiing and, and winter recreation is a huge part of New Hampshire, whether you're going to Cannon or Bretton Woods yeah. or Waterville or wherever. Yeah. It's a great part and a great part of the aspect of that quality of life that we have here. Uh, commuter rail doesn't enhance that quality of life. It just it, it has minimal, minimal effect. Mm -hmm. Like I said, a few hundred people a day will take it. This doesn't benefit the 1.3 million people that we have living here, whether you live in Keene or mm -hmm. Walpole or Littleton or Errol or Exeter. Mm -hmm. This commuter rail project really feeds the needs of, of a very, very select few at a massive cost to us all. Um, you know, and, and we can talk a little more about the airport. I do believe some folks would get on that train in Lowell in Massachusetts and maybe make Manchester a much more attractive place to fly out of. That's great, but again, not at the cost that we're seeing. There are other modes uh, of uh, transportation or marketing or other things to get Manchester back on track. I mean, it's doing pretty well. I don't want to imply that it's not on track. Uh, you know, back up there and keeping it a, a, yeah, a robust yeah. international airport. Uh, th this train is not the the the, the the lifeblood of uh, yeah. of the airport. There's lots of ways that that well, place. Well, yeah, can I mean, I, I've heard proponents say, "Well, you know, look at Europe, that it's accepted, and <laughs> European people, okay, right, you know, will will use the train, and you know, all is wonderful." We're now using Europe as our well, standard. Yeah, I mean, this is what I don't understand. I, I mean, Europe is, you know, Europe is Europe. You know, Europe we, is a Europe. lot of things we don't have in common. Our people will say, "Well, look at D.C." Well, I mean, D.C. is kind of unto itself, too. I mean, yeah, you can hop on, what, what do they call it in D.C.? Not the metro. The, oh, yeah, the metro. Is it the metro? Yeah, the metro, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can hop on and go straight to the airport. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people do because they're going away for one night mm -hmm. or whatever and have a carry-on. But, I mean, truthfully, I cannot imagine myself 
parking somewhere in Massachusetts mm -hmm. with lots of luggage for my, mm -hmm. you know, one or two week vacation and fooling around with it on the train and getting on the train and getting off the train and getting a cab over to the airport, yada, yada, yada. Le you know, I like, mean, like you said before, the greater population of, of Washington, D.C. or Philadelphia or New York is 10 to 50 times more than yeah, the population yeah, this train is going to yeah, serve. Yeah, exactly. Completely economic, completely yeah, different economic. It's like one. apples and oranges uh, and comparing them. Absolutely. But look, Unfortunately, there are those out there that just want this to happen no matter what. Well, yeah. And, and the arguments are weak. It's, um, they're, they're not based in, in, in fact. I mean, we have to look at facts and mm. numbers and data. Mm. And the argument will be, well, let's do this study to, to get the facts <laughs> and data. We've done the study. We've done it a couple times before. What have they before. been, like five or six? Um, over the entire history few. since the 80s, I think there's been five. The most recent ones, the ones that are still somewhat applicable and, yeah. and recent, I think there was a 2007 and a 2010 that, that was done. Um, so that recent. Yeah, so it's it's right there. So again, it's um it's just not it's not for us. It's not for us right now. Uh, maybe it would be for us down in, in the future. I find that hard to believe as well. But mm -hmm. at least let's I, I'd be willing to look at that down the mm -hmm. road. Like I said, some rail projects make sense. Mm -hmm. Some rail projects, again, especially when other people are paying for them, mm -hmm. um, it's something that that we probably should look at. It would be irresponsible not to look at. Mm -hmm. But this one makes no sense. To us. Well, while we're kind of on that subject, um, and probably a lot of people who are in this part of the state, I mean, we're we're in Bedford today mm -hmm. taping the show. Um, so a lot of people over in this side of the state or the northern part of the state or whatever probably haven't followed at all the fact that the T, the MBTA in, in Massachusetts, is um, looking to bring the commuter rail mm -hmm. Into Plasto. Into Plasto, and of course, yeah. Plasto is the next town from Haverhill, Massachusetts. Right. I mean, you know, if you're standing on the Haverhill side, you can spit and it will land on the Plasto That's right. side. And I know that you don't have a problem with that. So your critics would say, well, how come you're okay with that, but sure. you're not okay with this? Well, there's a big difference between a, a study that costs a couple hundred thousand dollars and a study that costs uh, four, three to four million dollars. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. This project also. Um, the way it looks now, there's a good chance the MBTA will fit the bill, both on the capital and operational side. Um, but they'll pay the whole cost? They'll pay the whole cost. That, that's a real potential avenue here. They want it out of, out of Haverhill yeah, so badly. Yeah, they want something out of it. Yeah. They want, yeah. uh, they want exactly. to get this layout, what they call the layover station, yes. where the trains have to essentially park themselves overnight, and they keep running. Yes. Um, yeah. So they want, that's right now, a, a community has built up around that layover station. It yes. causes a lot of problems. Well, the, the Bradford section of Haverhill. Exactly. Yeah, people over there have been howling for years, 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 years and to get years, rid of and it. years about it. Yeah. And look, I'm not a big fan of taking over the MBTA's problems, but if if they want it out so bad and they're willing to pay for it, then mm -hmm. obviously it's something that, that we should look at. And, mm -hmm. it, and it's reasonable. It's not a 60-mile um, a extension. Mm -hmm. It's a couple right. miles right Yeah, that's the all it is, right? Again, completely mm -hmm. different project, different economics. Yeah. Um, and much, Plasta um, wants it, if I'm not mistaken. Plasta wants it very bad. Government and the yep. people who love it. The even the folks in Atkinson, those, the, a lot of folks that were against it at first because one of the potential sites was near Atkinson, we've taken that site off the table. Mm -hmm. So right now there, there's really a very widespread support, even the, quote, anti rail people have mm -hmm. widespread support in at least doing this study because it's it's a it's a quick and easy one mm -hmm. so to say mm -hmm. and it'll tell us whether we can we can um, do this financially mm -hmm. uh, viably um, at a very low cost and again there's a good chance we can get mm -hmm. uh, and the MBTA and the folks in Massachusetts to pay for it and that makes a huge difference a, a huge difference this isn't 300 million and and, and for a study for <laughs> yeah 300 million of a of capital infrastructure plus 10 million <laughs> subsidy on this on the people in New Hampshire um, it's a, a potentially a small jump um, with with d putting the cost back out back out to Massachusetts, which I'll, I'll talk about all day long. So. Well, you know, we do have still a few minutes left to talk, um, so I don't know. I mean, I I hope I asked you the questions that got Should out. Should we take the, some calls? Huh? I'm yeah, just I wish we could. You know, <laughs> you I'm know, sure my not, phone will be ringing. Well, after we this are talk. we are actually going to reach that point soon. We're planning. Uh, that's great. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, it'd be kind of fun to take this, live you calls. You know, this is a great issue for the people, and it's important yeah. that people start talking about it. Yeah, because like I said, this is a a pinnacle project that is really defining a lot of the uh, mindset up in Concord right now. Well, let's just th let's just keep going with these with these projects. Let's throw money at the problem. Um, and, and in this case, we don't even have a problem in mm. throwing money at mm -hmm. it. Yeah, um, good point to that is. Yeah. Low, um, I think uh, Governor Thompson, a great governor from New Hampshire back in in the uh, in the 70s, um, he was once the model. Um, uh, of a couple speeches that, that Ronald Reagan and a couple folks out there gave on how to do things right, how to keep things local. And Governor Thompson was very famous for saying uh, low, low taxes are the result of low spending. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And that's just fact. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah. It's right there. Yeah. So if we're controlling our costs, we're keeping taxes low, we're keeping the cost burden on our families down. So unfortunately, when they have to pay a little more for gas or they're out of work for a little extra time, we're not burdening them with, with these massive taxes. Mm -hmm. And again, no one wants to talk about that T word, taxes, mm -hmm. up front, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what we need to be talking about. The only way a project like this survives is taxes. The only way that we support um, some of the budgets and, and the budget uh, programs that are being talked out there are taxes. Whether you want to talk about gambling and licensing fees or whatever, mm -hmm. it's taxes. I love when yeah, politicians almost, yeah. talk about the state's revenue. Our revenue projections are the state businesses make revenue. State doesn't have revenue. Mm -hmm. State collects taxes. Mm -hmm. They they're, they're found a, a convenient word not to you, not to mm -hmm. talk about not taxes. Not to say the word tax. That's, yeah. ex that's a big deal in the state. We've always kept our tax burden incredibly low one of the lowest in the country. Um, a few years ago, it got out of control. As spending got out of control with some of the Democrats in 06 and 08, mm -hmm. in those budgets, spending increased well over 20% in years when our revenues were, our revenues, our tax income was decreasing. Um, and we got into trouble. And we didn't go to a sales or income tax, but I implore all the folks out there to look at all the other taxes and fees, mm -hmm. car registration mm -hmm. fees, hunting fees, boating mm -hmm. fees. Mm -hmm. We have a hundred different ways to yes. tax you in this, and in this state. And they've been using them. And we will nickel and dime you to death. Yeah. And that's the problem with the government. They will quietly nickel and dime you to death. Oh, we don't want sales tax or income tax. Mm -hmm. But after that, mm -hmm. everything is on the table. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're going to do to push a lot of these programming dollars to appease the constituencies and the special interests that got them in there in the first place. That's exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be, just be very careful that as we go down that path, we're not losing what makes us so special as a state. We're not losing that that sense of New Hampshire, that we go to, I mean, most of us know, we go to other states and we brag about what we have mm -hmm. here. We're first in the nation primary, low tax base, lots of economic opportunity, very low unemployment rate. Those are all the results of the fundamental building blocks that we put in place for years and years. And unfortunately, some of those in Concord have eroded some of that. Luckily, our fundamentals are still strong and, and we can kind of take the hit. The hard work that was done years ago mm -hmm. in maintaining those building blocks, others take advantage of that to still claim that, well, we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. Well, okay isn't okay in the state of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We're tra traditionally the best in all these categories, whether it's health or education or quality of life. We are top of our game in the country. We're a model for others. And when we erode that and we're no longer number one, we're number five or six or ten, people want to con consider that a victory. Not in my book. New Hampshire is too good to let these in special interests erode what is so special about New Hampshire to appease their small constituencies. We have to work hard. And when I say we, it's not just the government. It's you. It's the folks out there. You have to talk to your, to your um, elected officials. We have 400 of them in the state. They're very easy to get a hold of. I keep my, my um, email and cell phone number on my website for a reason because mm -hmm. I have to be connected with what's going on out there. And, and, and for the most part, most of the people in the state really, really want to do what's right. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, I think, get a little misguided uh, over time. They lose, again, that, that global sense of how we got here in the first place. And it's incumbent upon us, the voters, the constituents, the people that are living their everyday lives. We, we, don't, we, we work a lot, you know, we, we, yeah, we uh, in, in private business. And, yep. and we, we all have things that eat up our day. We're taking care of our families. Mm -hmm. I don't expect the, con the constituents out there to spend all their time, you know, being um, political wonks like I am. Mm -hmm. But take the time to contact your representatives, contact your selectmen, contact your executive council, whoever it may be. Let them know what you're thinking mm -hmm. because we listen. We, we do. We really do listen and we count on that feedback from the people. And again, you know, it all, I, I just keep pushing that as a big proponent of commuter rail. If this is a project this state wants, the people have to say we want it or we, we don't. It makes no financial sense, I think, as we've, we've outlined a hundred yep. different ways yep. uh, already in, in this argument. It sounds good. It sounds like a nice project. There's absolutely no way to pay for it. I-93 is a major project that can bring real vital um, um, uh, transportation into this state. It's a project that's hung out there for 25 years. We're not even close to being done. Do we want to build a, a train system or do we want to take, our red, take care of our red listed bridges for the next 10 years? Because that's the, that's the equal that's what it comes right down there. To. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. Let's focus on our needs. When times are tough, you got to be tough. Yep. you got to say no. you got to prioritize. And I just really encourage the folks out there to get involved a little bit, talk to their representatives, um, and really understand the pushes and pulls of this issue and really the pushes and pulls of what's going on in Concord because it really has an impact on all of our lives. 
Chris, you have done a dynamite I'm job. I'm off and on you a know roll. Subject. What's next? <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you so I much. I want to have you back I'm, again. Anytime. All I love right. It. All right. Thanks well, so much. Well, this was a livelier show than I think you all expected. And boy, this guy knows how to tell it like it is, which makes him perfect to come back here. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye bye. <laughs>